All right, in this video, we are going to look at using parametric equations to analyze projectile motion problems. And so what these problems involve are <clears throat> some object being um, launched with an initial velocity. And essentially, all you need to know is the initial velocity, uh, the direction, and the magnitude, along with the initial height at which this object is launched. And then that determines everything. You can figure out the location of this object at any time. So we've got our parametric equations here. I'll talk a little bit about why they are what they are, but generally speaking, you'll probably, uh, you won't have to memorize them. You just need to apply them. But let's just kind of, you know, delve a little bit into what's going on here. So you're going to have some object being launched. This is the location at which it'll be launched. And uh, you need to be given its initial height. So usually textbooks often use S sub zero or S naught. Okay, that's the initial height. Notice where that is in our equations here. There and there. They're the same equation, just one, you know, depends on what unit you're given. Um, and then what I have here is <clears throat> a vector. So this is my velocity vector. And its magnitude we recognize with that notation. And then I've got an angle at which some projectile is being launched. So this triangle here is sort of our the way we're going to break down our velocity vector into its horizontal and vertical components. So I'm going to call this side A and this side B. Let's just see what trigonometry says about this triangle. So, uh, of course, we note that uh, cosine of theta is equal to uh, A over the magnitude. And sine of theta is equal to... b over the magnitude. And of course, this together implies that a is equal to the magnitude times cosine of theta, and b is equal to the magnitude times sine of theta. All right, now, so, you know, you, you could use this notation here if you wanted to. You could, you could represent your velocity vector um, in component form, right? So now we know that we could use this this bracket notation. That's the x component, and this is the y component. Okay, but more importantly, our parametric equations require these components. All right, so let's just do a brief overview of why these equations are what they are. Okay, so our parametric equations note the form, right? x of t and y of t. So x of t is going to be your your horizontal distance. So, let's see, horizontal distance. Why does it have the form it does above? Right, it's, you'll notice it's simpler, right? It's simpler than the, the vertical component, right? If you notice. Um, and that's because it's really just a distance equals rate times time situation, right? So I'll, I'll use that as a kind of a guiding post, right? Distance equals rate times time. So x of t, your horizontal distance, is your rate. Now your rate is um, the x component. This is your rate here, the x component of your velocity vector. So it's x of t equals, now your rate is the magnitude times cosine theta times t. Okay, where I'm, I'm kind of insinuating here that, uh, right, so your rate here is that, whatever that number ends up being, and uh, your, right, of course, your time is your time and your distance is, yeah, I'm running out of colors, but, okay, it's straight up distance equals rate, rate times time. So your horizontal distance is pretty straightforward. Um, your vertical distance is a little different because of gravity. So your vertical distance, right, why does that equation have the form it does? Well, I guess a nice way to think of it is, um, so your, hor your vertical distance, you can think of it as your height, right? So I'm going to say height is equal to, so what's a good scaffold here? Well, it's whatever the initial height is, right? It's what the, the starting height is plus um, the change in the height. But of course, that change 
is going to be affected by gravity. So I'm just going to, this is very informal here, but this lets us kind of plug things in <clears throat> nicely. So I'm going to say, so your height is y of t. Your start is your initial height, right? What's your initial height? It's s sub 0, whatever that is given to be. Your change is the same with your horizontal distance. It's a rate times time. Okay, so in this case, that's your rate. So I'm going to write magnitude of v sine of theta. Just going to zoom in a little bit. Sine of theta times t. But then, of course, that's not the end of the story, right? On a planet with no gravity, that would be the end of the story. But we know that on this planet, there's gravity. So um, depending on whether your units are in feet or in meters, you're going to use that term there. And, you know, in a physics class, you derive sort of why that is what it is. But we're just going to use them. So let's just pretend it's in uh, feet for, uh, for now. I think it was 16 t squared, right? And so, again, just matching things up, my height can be determined if I know my start and my change. And then, of course, accounting for gravity. All right, so there's that's why the equations look the way they do. More importantly, we're going to need to use them. And there's a lot of technology involved, at least the way I teach it. So uh, in this example, right, we're just going to deal with the mechanics of the calculator, how we use them to solve these uh, these projectile motion problems. All right, so this says a golf ball is fired from a cannon at an initial velocity of 20 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal from a height of 10 meters. Model the situation with parametric equations and, pre and then predict how far away the ball will hit the ground. All right, let's get our parametric equations down. Um, the general form. So I'm in meters, right? So my y, uh, my y equation is going to need to reflect that. So my parametric equations are going to be x of t equals the magnitude of my initial velocity times cosine of theta times t, and then y of t is going to be again. I always like to write it this way because it reminds me of why it works. Initial height. Uh, plus magnitude sine theta t. And then I'm going to use the this term, of course, because we're in meters. All right, so like we don't always have to draw a picture because we sort of derived it in the last um, in the last page. But just one more time, like what's going on here? We can see that this object's being launched right from that location, right? So if we kind of redraw it here, right? So the initial height is 10 meters. Uh, it's being launched in this direction, just 30 degrees. Okay, at 30 degrees. And it's being ha uh, launched at 20 meters per second. So I'll just label this 20 meters per second. Okay, and so from there, right, the horizontal and vertical components of my velocity vector those are what I need because I'm going to put those in to my parametric equations. So from, a, from above, we note that A is equal to 20 cosine of 30 degrees, and B is equal to 20 sine 30 degrees. And those are precisely what I need for my parametric equations. So let's first write those down, and then we'll answer the question they asked us. So my parametric equations will look like this. So x of t equals, my magnitude is 20, 20 cosine of 30 degrees times t, and then y of t is equal to initial height, which is 10, plus 20 sine 30 degrees t minus 4.9 t squared. Now, if you're in my class, you note that I like to store things in my calculator as letters. So I'm probably going to store that in my calculator as A. I'm probably going to store this as B. It just helps a little bit. I don't have to keep typing 20 cosine 30, uh, etc. 
All right, so we're going to turn to the calculator in a second, but uh, what's the question we're actually trying to answer here? That's the model. We know we know how to model the location of this of this ball. And in fact, one thing we should point out is that you know what does this what do projectile motion problems look like? Well, here's a you know we've got my x and y coordinates here. The initial height's going to be 10 meters, so I'll just put that there. And I think we all understand how it works, right? You, you launch it and then gravity starts acting on it and it has a parabolic trajectory. And so the, the relevant questions that a teacher or anyone could ask would be like, you know, what's this, you know, what's the maximum height of the ball? And when does that occur? You could ask things like, uh, when does it hit the ground, right? That would be this location here. So that might be relevant, right? When does it hit the ground? Um, you could ask other things like, what if there's a fence somewhere over here, right? Is it going to clear that fence? There are a whole bunch of questions you can ask. Okay, but notice that this is a parabolic, parabolic motion here. All right, so let's go back to the question. It says, uh, predict how far away the ball will hit the ground. So let me restate that as an official question. How far away... Will the ball hit the ground? All right, so the key thing to understand is that the ball's going to hit the ground when the height is zero, right? So as a sort of a, a scaffolding question, this is going to occur when the height is zero. In other words, when y of t is equal to 0. So we need to analyze our height function, the one up here that I'll highlight in yellow. We need to, an oops. We need to highlight the, uh, analyze this one. Okay. And one thing to point out is we're going um, to do this by just graphing my, my height as a function of time. Okay, so what I mean by that is I'm going to put in, right, I'm going to think of time as my independent variable and y of t, my height, as my dependent variable. So this is going to be another parabola, but it's different than the one above. Okay, so the, this parabola is going to look like this, right? The initial height is still 10 meters, right? So time goes by, the ball goes up, and then it comes down. So that'll also be parabolic. The difference is that this is a time versus height parabola, right? So our, I mentioned this because it'll help us when we're choosing a window in our calculator, right? Like how long does a ball stay in the air for? No longer than, what, four to five seconds, if that. So that'll help us uh, choose a window. All right, but let's go to our calculator and do all the, the things we need to do. So I'm going to use this calculator here. So the first thing I'm going to do is what I said. I'm going to store 20 cosine of 30 as A. Also, make sure you're in degree mode, as I am. So 20 cosine 30. Okay, I'm going to store that as A. And 20 sine 30. I'm going to store that as B. All right. So right now I need to analyze my height versus time um, equation. So I go into y equals, and I'm just analyzing right now my, uh, my height. So I'm going to type in 10 plus, now I can use b because I stored it, rather than typing 20 sine 30. Uh, b times, we use x instead of t, minus 4.9 t squared, which is x squared. Now we got to think about our window, okay, before we just hit graph. So, as I said, this is a time versus height. So, my x window should not be much farther than 5 seconds. And then the height, well, it's launched at 20 meters per second, but diagonally, it's going to immediately start falling. I don't know, maybe like 40 might be a maximum for my for my y. So, my x looks pretty good. My y max probably doesn't need to be that big. Let's just make it 50. And see what that looks like. Graph. Okay, um, let me clear the computations there. All right, so there it is. Um, 
So what am I interested in here? How far away will the ball hit the ground? So I need to know when it hits the ground. So I need to calculate a zero. I need to calculate this x-intercept. So second, calculate, and zero. Okay, so I'm going to have to scroll a little bit until I get a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right of the x-intercept. So a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. And there it is, the zero is 2.77, let's say 2.776. Oops, uh, 2.776, so I'll write that here. So in our diagram here, that is this value here. Okay, that's 2.776 seconds, we'll say. Now normally I would store that value, this, this iPad calculator doesn't allow me to, um, it doesn't record what X is right now on a previous screen. Um, so I'm going to write that, you know, 2.776, that, that should be good enough. So that is the time at which the height is zero. If you ask, if you look at the question though, it says, how far away will the ball be um, when it hits the ground? So that's a horizontal distance, right? So we need to plug this time value into our horizontal equation. So I'm going to do X of Right, my x equation up here, I'm going to do x of 2.776. Okay, I need to know the horizontal position at that time. So that's just going to be a, the thing I recorded as a, or stored as a, times 2.776. So I go back to my screen here, and I do a times 2.776. I press enter, and it's going to be about 48.08 .08 meters away. All right, so that's just one of the many questions we could ask. We'll stop there for this intro, um, intro video, and we'll do a, another one um, with more types of questions in a in a separate video. Okay, but just know that we introduced. Right, we introduced parametric equations, we took a look at why they have the form they do, and we used our calculator to answer this particular question about how far away a ball will travel um, given these initial conditions.